What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Ham Radio Crash Course. Welcome to Saturday. We got another big show. I was thinking to myself, you know, what's an area we haven't talked about? And it's microwaves, ham radio microwave communication. And I've got the right guy for the job. We've got Hayden of Ham Radio DX in the house, and it's going to be a lot of fun because I've already seen the slides, so I know what you're getting in for, and it's going to be awesome. So I hope you're ready. It's a super cool, I think microwaves are super interesting. If you're not new to it or this is the first time you're hearing about it, I think you're going to have a lot of fun. So enjoy the memes as we kick things off. There's that white box again. That tells me I still have something broken in those memes, and I don't know why. But anyway, how's it going, everybody? I'm Josh, KI6NAZ. You found the Ham Radio Crash Course. Hopefully, again, thanks so much for coming out. If you could, watching this, uh, click the thumbs up. I'd appreciate it. Got a couple of news things I want to hit right up front. A couple of really interesting ones. So uh, let's let's dive right into that, and then we'll go a little bit further. So first of all, Ham Radio Crash Course is our website. You can find out about all the things we got going on, including our podcast uh, that I do with my wife. We have our upgraded or updated field day shirts for 2021. Those are at hamtactical.com, the merch store that my wife runs. And it includes all kinds of fun comments, uh, which you can see here uh, as she <laughs> does, does all the ad copy. So check that out. Just a reminder as you're thinking about what you're going to be doing next month, July 17th and 18th, is the POTA annual support your parks plaque event. We had a video last week that we talked about that, and we'll probably air that as we get closer. We're quickly quickly approaching field day, so that's obviously going to be important as well. This weekend, there is a contest. It is the uh, f the second full weekend in June, which is June 12th and 14th this year. It is the VHF contest for ARRL. And speaking of this, uh, just to kind of get your, your mind thinking about your future uh, antenna farm goals, Valerie over at uh, the Ham Nation sent us pictures. We couldn't get these on the last show, so I wanted to show them on our show. This is the station, the antennas that she's running for today's uh, contest, this weekend's contest. She's got a 15 element 1.25 meters antenna at 65 feet. She has a 70 centimeter at 130 feet, a 2 meter at 125 feet, and a 6 element uh, at fi for 15 meters at 100, or 120 feet. Next to that, check out this antenna, guys. 10 elements on 6 meters at 40 feet and a 6 over 6 over 6 on 20 meters. That's that vertical stack of 20 meter uh, Yaggies that's right there at 60, 100, and 180 feet. That's intense. 10 elements on 6 meters at 80 feet. This is all one station. <laughs> 9 elements on 6 meters at 50 feet six elements on six meters at 45 feet and you know for the heck of it a phased array antenna for when the pants are dead says valerie so valerie thank you for for sharing that with us that's that's very cool uh that was a really awesome uh <laughs> when i got that in my inbox i was like well that is a very intense uh, antenna farm i've never seen something like that so amazing uh there has been some hullabaloo about a new shegu radio that's coming out the X6100, which looks like the spiritual successor to the X5105. I ran this through a translator app. You can go to my Twitter page. It's Hoshnasi at Twitter. Uh, the link is in the description if you want to see a more zoomed in picture of the text, because the text is kind of hard to read with the translation. But I'll give you the kind of overview of it. They've added USB-C, it looks like, from what we can see there on the image, which is greatly appreciated. There is a card slot now so that you can do live QSO recordings. It's probably got a similar battery to what it had in the past, which was fantastic. They've now added Bluetooth Wi-Fi capability. At least that's what it says, you know, if you're looking at the picture right there. Uh, but what's interesting is the last part right there. It says a powerful operating system that supports a wider range of function extensions. It's possible that this could have Linux running on it, which would be just awesome if that was the case. Something that's running Linux like this would just be very, very interesting and compelling. So uh, yeah, that's, that's very cool. So I was very interested to see that, and I hope to see more in the future, and we'll be checking it out. 
Okay, that's pretty much all I needed to do for the opening. So we're going to pull. Uh, somebody said, Dear Noob said Android. Could be Android. Maybe it's running Android. Don't know. But I want to get right into the fun with Hayden, and we're going to take your questions as we go along, but we'll, we'll have a Q&A portion at the end so we can, we can get answers going because uh, this is going to be a topic that I think is, is going to be really interesting to people. So hang on to your butts all because here comes Hayden, Ham Radio DX. <laughs> how are you doing, hey Josh, Hayden? how are you? Very good, good very good. good. Hey, Valerie's Valerie's station, man. I mean, that is just insane. That uh, that crazy. setup she's got going on there. It's I've literally I've never seen a VHF antenna farm like that. I they, and appreciate. Oh. I'm sure they have just as crazy an outfit for HF. But man, that was impressive. Don't so. worry, I'm I'm very very jealous. Hey, um, actually, it it reminded me you talked about field day coming up. I think our field day here, our VHF UHF field day here in Australia is actually I think on the same weekend. Uh -huh. And the reason I know that is because they had to put out a. Um, news article to say that the ISS has their repeater I think turned on for that field day Ooh. and I th and I think that you c I think the US VHF field day you can make contacts via the ISS uh, satellite mm -hmm. contacts and you can get the points however yes. in our rules you're not allowed to get the points so they had to say guys the repeater is going to be turned on but you can't get the points for any contacts what? over it so. why why, why though? Why? Because I mean, I appreciate it's a, it is a satellite, right? A, a mm. satellite is running a repeater. It's just crossband yeah. repeater. Do you yeah. So, so our, our rules say that you can't make contacts via repeaters. So they include satellites in that for some reason. But wow, even the yeah. complexity behind making a satellite contact, and they won't yeah. take it, won't yeah. accept it. I mean, it should be worth double points, really. I I agree. Well, I mean, that's how it works in uh, for the ARRL. If you make a contact, you get one hundred bonus points. Just I'll tell you what, good luck making contact on that repeater that weekend, though. <laughs> or, or any satellite. But, yes, it's very well, difficult. Well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. So how's it going? What, what's what been going on with you? You haven't been on in a little while. I mean, your your pre presentations that you've done on, on the channel here is, like, some of my favorite ones. So I'm very excited oh, to you. have you back. I hope you're doing well. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i not too bad. I've been a bit sick during the week, and I was just saying to you before we, we went live mm -hmm. that I hope that my my voice was going to be okay for this weekend, but it seems like it's all right. So, yeah, looking forward to showing you through through some of this. Um, I, I'm sort of uh, – I, I sort of started off with not knowing a lot about microwaves anyway, so it's, it's sort of – this comes from a bit of a getting started basic type of um, – uh, viewpoint so yeah that's that's where good. i am i need i need all of that so i did i did want to mention this because i forgot to mention in the opening i am going to drink a beverage today is the topo chico hard seltzer because it is hot where i'm at right now so i'm going to go with something to cool me off a little bit no heavy beers we're just going with a big boy seltzer can what's I guess. the what's the temperature there uh where i am at right now it is 85 85 Ooh. degrees yeah so it's a little warm uh the, yeah. the the attic or the roof line says it is 107 so it's Ooh. the exhaust fans trying to pull everything out but <laughs> it's it's warm let me just tell you it's it's cold here that's all i'll say <laughs> yes i want to remind everybody as we get started there is a, a link in the description to go to hayden's channel ham radio dx because hayden what's going on in your channel right now something you wanted to mention i think Oh, I'll get uh, that's that's in the second slide. Let's let's okay. get the slides going. Well, fine. let's move right into it. We got to be all professional. Yeah. Here we go. All right. There we go. Cool. And We're I'll good get to out go. of the way. Let me let me remove myself. <laughs> you, you can, can start it. I'll, I'll get off. You can go off to the right underneath me if you want. That's oh, fine. Oh, let's do that. Can I do that? Yeah. Yeah, you keep talking and I'll move. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we've got uh, so we've got uh, getting started in microwave. So as Josh said, I'm Hayden. Um, I am at a radio call signs uh, VK seven HH. I'm in Australia, but I also hold a technician license KD nine SSB, and I'm quite I'm quite proud and quite uh, <laughs> I like I like I love that call sign. So that was uh, <laughs> that was random. That was just the one that came from the FCC. So I was quite happy about that. That's pretty um, good. I'm on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all under that Ham Radio DX channel. So, uh, uh, sorry, name. So, just do a search for it, and you'll find me on there. So, as Josh mentioned, bit of a shameless plug. I on YouTube currently this morning I had eight thousand nine hundred and ninety-seven subscribers. So, I am three away from nine thousand. So, Make if it happen, you guys. Uh, yeah, so if you want to head over there and check out some of my videos and hit subscribe, that would be fantastic. Um, however, talking about microwaves, I have a couple of playlists and I have, because some of my, micro I haven't done 
I haven't done a lot of my microwave videos for a while, so I've put them into playlists so that you can find them rather than scrolling back through my uh, my uploads to find them. So on my channel, there's two playlists that you uh, can have a look for. That is to Gigahertz and Beyond, which is a bit of a, a play on Buzz Lightyear's to Infinity and Beyond, um, and, uh, microwave, and Microwave Newcomers. <clears throat> so the Microwave Newcomers basically has some uh, videos which is – detailing the builds, the, the, the transverters and, and antennas and things that I use uh, in a little bit more detail. Mm -hmm. uh, and to gigahertz and beyond sort of has our portable operations, making contacts and uh, all that sort of fun stuff. Well, we, we got a live update. You're, you've now hit 9,000. 9, so. Oh, already. <laughs> I, I don't know that was a high bar to hit, but uh, it's hey, done. Hey, hey, guys, do you want to hit me, uh, hit, hit me, get me to hit 10,000? <laughs> <laughs> very good yes. oh dear thank you very much that's i really appreciate that um so there's a couple of screenshots there from some of my videos we've got um we did some uh we do a lot of eme uh, earth moon earth down here so uh one of the bands we do that is on 10 gigahertz so uh, we did a video on that uh on the right hand side there that one is a wrap-up video of a, a DX record that we broke, and I'll go into a little bit more detail later on in the slides for that one. Uh, and the bottom right-hand corner is we tried FT8. We, we decided to have a bit of a go at FT8 on some of the higher bands, and there's some challenges in doing that. It's, it's uh, a little bit more challenging than HF FT8, but we'll get into that as well. So check those videos out. Okay, so I pulled this up from Wikipedia. This is frequency bands, and a lot of you would be familiar with the HF, VHF, and UHF uh, spectrums. So this, this breaks it down quite nicely. So HF is uh, 30 to 30 megahertz, so 100 to 10 meters. And bit, you can sort of, I should have removed all the stuff on the right-hand side, but that gives you a bit of an idea of what's in that spectrum. Uh, VHF is 30 to 300 megahertz. Mm -hmm. Uh, UHF is 300 to 3000 megahertz uh, or 3 gigahertz. And then we start to get into some of the serious stuff. We start to get into the really high frequency stuff. So super high frequency SHF is 3 to 30 gigahertz. Extremely high frequency is uh, 30 to 300 gigahertz. And then we get up into the terahertz or tremendously high frequency, which is 300 to 3000 gigahertz. And you can see there, you'll notice the wavelengths start to decrease they go from meters to millimeters a very very quickly so they go from, yeah meters centimeters to millimeters mm -hmm. and uh and and our wavelengths get very very small as we start to go up in into uh, the higher frequencies so some of the things that you'll find in those bands commercially are uh, satellites and uh, microwave relay stations um, radar, all those sort of things are up at those really high uh, frequencies. And also when you get really, really high, you get X-rays and MRIs and all sorts of things. So that's all, uh, all RF. So very interesting, um, uh, very interesting once you get up to those really high, high frequencies. Get pumped. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Means a lot. Yeah, thanks, get pumped. I forgot to say, Josh, if you do want to just, uh, if I do rabble on a bit, just stop me, especially if we have super chats come in. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank no problem. And if there's a question that I think you can answer at that moment, we'll, we'll throw it to you too. Yeah, sure. So uh, what are the common, some of the common microwave bands that we have uh, as amateurs? Well, <clears throat> generally, but not technically, everything above one gigahertz is classed as microwave. So if we go back again, we'll have a look mm -hmm. at that that diagram we can see that three up to three gigahertz is still uhf it's not right in it, it's it's still in the same band as as uh as 440 so um so basically we say generally everything is above one gigahertz because we're getting into the gigahertz spectrum that's classed as microwave so that includes uh 23 centimeters so we we say 1296 here in australia that's the the main frequency band uh, 13 centimeters, which is 2.4 gigahertz, so same as uh, your common Wi-Fi at home. 3.4 gigahertz, which is 9 centimeters, and unfortunately, I think in the United States, you recently lost access, I think, to a portion or all of the 9 centimeter band, I, I believe think. a portion. I think it was something that yeah. got rolled back a little bit in, in part, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's another thing to mention about all of these bands because they have so much bandwidth. They're in high demand commercially, yeah. um, so... 
us using the bands are a very important thing to do because we don't want to lose them here. In, uh, and as you mentioned, like here in Australia, we've lost quite a lot of spectrum in the uh, 2.4, 3.4 gigahertz bands. And I think we we could even lose some more spectrum as well in, in other bands. So we're at danger of losing them as well. Um, sometimes I hear the argument that, oh, well, if we're going to lose it, there's no point trying it out anyway. But I mean, uh, we, I, I think I've been doing this for about four or five years now and i we've we've still got spectrum we're still we're still got a portion of the band that we can use so um and you know we're talking about two like if you want to do single sideband contacts or cw or something that's only a very 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 small portion of the spectrum so i can't imagine that they couldn't at least give us a little bit of spectrum just to experiment with going forward in the future even if we did lose a lot of it it's kind of hard to see a world where it, uh, we lose an entire band. Usually what mm. happens is it, it gets chiseled away until we mm. get to a point where it's more feasible to the amount of use it's getting. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's what happened to, uh, what is it, 220, right? 220, 220 megahertz uh, space band, yeah. 1.25 or something like that. Uh, that one got slowly kind of whittled down over time as, as less and less people, even some countries mm. have, have kind of gotten rid of it. Yeah, I found that it's easier to uh, it's easier to keep hold of of spectrum that you've already got, even if it's just a small portion, rather than get new spectrum. So, like here, we tried access to the sixty meter band, but we can't get access because the Australian Defence the Australian Defence Force uses it primarily. Right. So, um, whereas you guys have access to that band, so um, I think that as long as we've got spectrum and you know we can demonstrate hey we're using it we use it here we've got all of these links all of these people using it experimenting with it then the 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 chances that we we'll lose it completely are, are, are low which is it, which it is happens good. it happens but it does happen yeah you know it, i i don't know that I'm, I'm not in support of losing anything by the way as i say this i just feel no. that it's not going to be a total 100 mm. percent loss like tomorrow kind of thing yeah. Um, so some of the other bands that we've got is 5.8 gigahertz again. Uh, so that's six centimeters. Again, we've got uh, your your um, home Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. 10 gigahertz, which is uh, probably uh, you're probably one of the most popular um, microwave bands, uh, especially for those who like to do Earth, Moon, Earth, EMA. Um, 10 gigahertz is very very popular, and there's a lot of um, uh, industrial ex commercial type of gear that you can that you can get and modify if you if you're sort of in the real experimenter and want to do that the uh the 5.8 that's i think around where arden exists uh the five yeah. gigahertz space and and that's a you know that's microwave as well we talked about that yeah. a couple of months ago so you know that's totally something that's accessible for most people that's like off the shelf amazon stuff yeah, 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 for sure. And I think because you were using you, you were using Ubiquity links for that, weren't you? A couple of them are Ubiquity, but now yeah. I'm on the another. Oh, I can't remember what it is. The Microtech. Oh, um, Microtech. Microtech. Mi Microtech. Yeah. Yep. Is yeah, that yeah. how you guys pronounce it? Microtech. We 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 pronounce it Microtech because it's M I K. But. Ah, <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I can see yeah. that. We, we we say Microtech, but okay. Uh, yeah, we we use those quite uh, quite extensively here, and they're actually fairly cheap. Like you can bridge your own wi-fi across to your, oh, your yeah. neighbor or or even across town if you really wanted to i'm going so. i'm going 45 kilometers to a repeater yeah. site from my house which is like yeah insane to do that uh yeah. while you're on this slide i know you got one more but is is there a particular and I'm, you may get into this and if you are just you know tell me to wait a second is there a particular reason why you'd pick one band over another um that's actually a good question. I don't have it later on in the slides. Probably if you're going to pick one band over another, there's a few things to take into consideration. And one of those is popularity and what you want to do with it. Mm -hmm. If you want to do EME, then you would definitely go for 10 gigahertz because the amount of people that are on that worldwide is quite high, um, especially in Europe. Um, and here in VK, I mean, uh, you can you can work plenty of VK 10 gigahertz stations on EME. Sure. And when we talk, when we're talking about this, a lot of this is um, pre-arranged contacts. Right. It's not like you can call CQ and have someone respond to you because of the short distances terrestrially, and also you need to be there at the right time if you're doing EME off the moon, that sort of thing. And, and um, I'll just say the acronym: EME is Earth, Moon, Earth. So you're literally yes. bouncing signals off of the moon. Right, mm. to make that happen i mean you can bounce signals off the moon off of any of these bands but as you start to get higher up in frequency it 
tends to become more harder. Mm -hmm. Um, 10 gigahertz is actually a very good band because you can, you, the, the high, the other thing is the higher in frequency you go, the more gain you can get into your system. So in your dish, um, and, and you can, you can have sort of a similar performance to what you get on a lower band. So sometimes, sometimes it's not, uh, if I try Earth, Moon, or Earth off at 23 centimetres, it's going to be the same as 10 gigahertz, not necessarily. Sometimes you can get stronger signals on on 10 gigahertz and it's a smaller it's a smaller setup as well. So smaller dishes, those sort of things. Um, but, yeah, as far as what you were saying about picking a band, if you want to sort of start, the easiest place to start would be 23 centimetres, 1296. Um, one point two, one point two gigs, because there's already like there's there's Yaesu mobiles out there. There's the Icom IC ninety seven hundred. There's the Kenwood TS two thousand uh, with the twenty three centimeter board in it. There's the the old Icom IC nine ten. So there's plenty of radios that actually come with twenty three centimeters in them. Mm, okay. um, and it's fairly easy to to build up an antenna or to even buy an antenna. You can just Google twenty three centimeter antenna, and there'll be plenty of of diagrams and and how to build them, and also plenty of places to buy them. So, um, but then other considerations for other bands you need to look at is like two point four gigahertz. I mean, that's a very noisy and a very crowded band. Um, is that just because so, of the Wi Fi and everything else that's yeah. out there and the commercial yeah. gear that runs off of that? Because two point four has yeah. been populated in the commercial space for. I mean, going on decades now, right? Mm, mm. Yeah, and I mean, even 5.8 gigahertz is getting slightly right. noisier as well. However, 5.8 gigahertz has the advantage that there's more bandwidth, there's, there's more of the band to use. So it means that you can find a place in the band that's quiet, that's not as noisy as, as say, 2.4 gigahertz because there's um, it's very, very congested. Right. Because I think on Wi-Fi, I think there's 13 channels. I think that's right. Oh, you, you got me on that one. I don't know that Ooh. stuff off the top of my See, head. It's, it's either 11 or 13 channels. I can't I, remember. I Google some, that some, stuff. <laughs> someone, someone will know in the chat. But yeah, I think the I'll, chat's going to blow up. Yeah, yeah, it will. They'll be like, no, it's not that much. You uh, idiots. You idiots. <laughs> uh, I won't guess at how many it is on 5.8, but I know it's it's a lot more. Um, And then... You can you can go even higher. So twenty four gigahertz is another band. Uh, so yeah, Cameron G says thirteen. Uh, correct fourteen if you're in in Japan. Um, so yeah, twenty four gigs. That's that's twelve. Mi- that's the twelve millimeter band. <laughs> so yeah, one one point two centimeters. So you're starting to get to really really small wavelengths, and that presents a problem when you're transmitting and receiving because everything in between starts to become a barrier to that it starts to reflect off of it it starts to become absorbed by it and you start to get losses and it and it becomes really really difficult to to make contact right so why on earth would you want to do microwave well i think that's why everybody's here why do this why are we do why are we talking about this yeah so there's there's some cool things about it it can be challenging so if you're sort of looking for the next thing to to have a go at and to try and challenge yourself that's always a a a good thing place to uh, a microwave is always a good thing to start with um designing and constructing your own equipment sometimes especially for me the building and constructing and putting together your station is more enjoyable than going out there and doing the contacts and being successful oh boy Um, do i feel that i oh man i feel that (laughs) i mean definitely you you get a sense of i i think what re- is really good is when you actually make that, uh, and, I, and I go into this a little bit later on, but when you make that ex- that that contact that you've been trying for, you've built the system up and you've got it working, and then you make this like rare contact over whatever distance it is and or under whatever conditions, and you're like, yes, you know, I this is with gear that I built myself, and then right. and then usually nine times out of ten, you're like, oh. Oh, that 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 signal could have been stronger. I wonder what I can do to tweak my system to make it a little bit better. And then it's like hot rod in a car almost. At and some then point, you right? spend more money. Right, right, all right. Throw more money at it. Oh, Look, you thought yeah. about putting a turbocharger on that thing. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's that's exactly what it's like. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, 
So the other thing you can do is you can repurpose old commercial gear and antennas. So as we mentioned, 2.4 gigahertz, 5.8 gigahertz Wi-Fi bands. There's a ton of equipment out there. And I'm not talking like the little antennas that you plug in the back of your Wi-Fi router. No. I'm talking about the dishes that you'd see on like commercial, um, what do you call them, cell towers over there and things like that. So um, you can you can make use, use of all that. A lot of our commercial links that are, that are on these towers, they've replaced them over time because they used to have radios which would be bolted to the back of the dish or they would have them down in the, uh, in the, in the hut, in the, in the building. And what they've done is to make them more efficient, they've replaced them with IP link gear. So they've uh, put that up on the tower, pulled the dish down, and then they have no use for it anymore. So oh, okay. you can go and repurpose it. So, Yeah, I'm sure we'll get to it, but somebody's asking in the chat is, what's your feed line like for this type of stuff? But that's yeah. a very important point on microwave, and I know you're going to get to it, so I'll, I'll let you keep going. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, feed lines are very uh, important important discussion, which we will go into um, down down in the slides. I'm not sure how much time we've got today too, Josh, but I've been rambling. We're going to go the full hour, so you still got like 35 minutes. So yeah. Okay, good, good. So, um, so yeah, the other thing you can do is, is study and experiment with propagation over short to long distances. Now, I say short to long distances because it depends on what you want to do and also what station you have. Um, you can aim for long distance uh, communication, and that usually happens due to tropospheric ducting. Right. Uh, so you, you're there in California. You're actually in a very good spot to try and make contact with Hawaii. Hawaii. Now Hawaii is what four thousand kilometers away yeah. or something. We we had a, a there's a, a local amateur here who lives not not too far from me. Rex VK7 MO. He's quite known in the Earth Moon Earth circles. Before COVID hit last year, he was actually going to travel to Hawaii and he was going to try and do 10 gigahertz from Hawaii to California. So um, let, let's put that into perspective. Uh, tropospheric ducting, actually, the last one of the last times you were on the live stream, you talked about sporadic E. You did a really good yep. talk on that, which was amazing. And I'm assuming that sporadic E tropospheric ducting factors into this. But barring those situational times that you can make these much longer communication about how reasonable is a QSO if you just line sighted it? Oh, yeah. So, um, so, but speaking about sporadic key, sporadic key doesn't affect the microwave bands. It doesn't oh. affect anything usually over 220. 220 oh, okay. is probably yeah, the higher good. limit. Good. But tropospher tropospheric ducting, um, if there's, if there's no enhancement whatsoever, um, there's, there's no local conditions, you can you can definitely make it's not it's not necessarily line of sight depending on your power and your stations you can have contacts over much greater distances even with mountains in between and in actual fact there's a video on my channel and i think in a later slide where there is a mountain range between me and another station and we use a cool propagation effect called knife edge refraction where the signal will actually bounce off the side of the mountain and then we'll refract at a different angle down back towards where he's located. And in that, uh, in, in that video, you can see me, I'm moving the antenna and I'm moving it just a little bit and you can see the signal meter go up and down like quite rapidly because of the different angles and reflections that you're getting off the mountains. Um, but, uh, but as far as, you know, point to point, line of sight, then unless you're getting up to really, really, really high frequencies, then you're gonna almost be, you're gonna be successful every time you mm -hmm. you do this. Even with very, even with very very low power levels, you can do this. You you generally will need to have somebody that you you is ready to receive, yeah. right? Because this is not an <clears throat> omnidirectional thing, as we're gonna get further into this. No, right? no. I mean, you can you could you could run omnidirectional on twelve ninety six, uh, one point two gigahertz for okay. sure, uh, because it's it's the lower end and it's actually it's actually surprising how well that band actually does. Um, it's 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 very impressive. So you could definitely run omnidirectional on that band, but as you start to get higher, two point four gigahertz. If you were if you're talking to, you know. Oh, if you've got a decent amount of power and, and it's flat and you can see a lot of the other stations, then you probably could talk out, you know, um, I don't know, 20, 30 miles maybe with an okay. omnidirectional antenna, depending on how much power you're putting out and, and where that's your receiver is. That's pretty impressive, actually. That, yeah, okay. yeah. I, I, think that's, I think that's pretty impressive. 
yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, it all depends on the other end too, like what equipment they're running. If it was omnidirectional right. to omnidirectional, it's not going to be good as if you had two directional antennas sure. pointing at each other. Sure, that makes sense. Um, there's another propagation mode which is quite interesting too, and that's rain scatter. So when you start to get up to these higher bands, if you have a rain cloud, uh, if you have a, a what do you call it, a rain cloud, rain cloud, band of rain? A band of rain, uh, uh, the rain band. Yeah, that's the, the rain band. The rain band. <laughs> I've, I've heard weather. I'm sure I've heard weatherman call them a rain band before. Yeah, it's I don't the, know. the the water uh, band plan. You know, there's, there's gaseous water and <laughs> solid water and liquid water. That's all. That's all just different bands of water. If you think about uh, it. Well, see, this is one of the things that I I always get caught up with uh, in Australia. We have this saying: "Is, see, how how wet was that rain?" And it's like pretty wet. <laughs> so, I don't know where that come from. Is but that anyway. just means like more rain? Like the, if yeah, it's a yeah. wetter rain, it's yeah, more. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I got you. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we have rain scatter. So what you can do is uh, bounce, uh, not bounce, sorry. You can scatter your microwave signals through the rain cloud and the they'll scatter through the droplets. And a, a station who's at the other end who may not be able to see you directly, so not line of sight, if you both point your antennas both at that same rain cloud, you can then make contact with one another. And the effects are quite interesting. If you listen on... If you listen on SSB, if anyone's ever heard what aurora activity sounds like when you're mm -hmm. bouncing a signal off auroral, it actually sounds a little bit like that, um, this sort of hollow type type noise. If you do it on FM, it's quite funny because the static actually makes it sound like you're listening. It actually sounds like it's raining in the speaker. So um, when you're listening to whoever it is, uh, it, it sounds like they, they've got water droplets on their microphone. But um, uh, So that's cool. Um as I said, line of sight, but it's not always. You can do high-speed data and large bandwidth stuff such as amateur television and, and high-speed data across these these links, so a bit like the Arden uh, network that you're talking about. And you can operate portable, and some people even do this for SOTA, and that <laughs> quite that's going to be a challenge. Interesting. Well, yeah. I, 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 um, I think it was red from uh, Red Summit RF, Charlie. I'm pretty sure he did a soda, active, a soda Summit activation the other day and he had 1.2 gigahertz with him because I, I saw that in his video. So Wow. Oh, I got to go back and look at that. That's, a pre that's impressive. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. So now <laughs> a lot of people will be going, what's going on here? This is, this is a bit of an insider joke for all the Australians in the, uh, in the, ch in the chat and watching. So we have once a year, a, uh, a, 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 a gathering. So sort of, it's a bit like a, it's a bit like a, a hamvention type of thing where it's a, it's a technical conference where everyone who's interested in microwaves all gathers together. Now, <laughs> usually what happens is, is everyone who is seriously involved in microwaves has a beard so we come up with this insider joke that your beard length depends on how much gain you get on the microwave band right, so right. uh so so we've got here we've got myself at the moment i've got unity gain i'm, I'm working towards 3db and 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 uh, i think uh, josh during the middle of covid you were probably hanging around about three three db yeah i was i definitely yeah. was yeah i yeah. i don't get vertical so much as just all over just out <laughs> it's just from every possible direction and the ultimate is uh, is is six dB. Uh, that's uh, that's when you really start to uh, uh, you really start to get the gain on uh, on microwaves. So, I like it. <laughs> so that's all. That's a bit of an insider joke, yeah. So uh, the 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 better the beard, the more the more gain is. So, you, uh, but the the prerequisite, the joke is the prerequisite is to do microwaves. You need a beard. Just right. Uh, just saying. Yeah. Okay. So some of the things we do locally here. Uh, Earth, Moon, Earth, mount, Moon Bounce, as we said. Uh, so the some of the photos there, I'll just point out, that's uh, Rex VK7, Mike Oscar with his uh, little portable setup, his little, I think that's a 60-centimetre dish. Uh, and down the bottom there, I think what they are doing is they have their dishes set up pointing at the moon and they're listening to uh, the... In Germany, there's a 10 gigahertz beacon that that tracks the moon and transmits power... Uh, on 10 gigahertz that you can actually tune into and listen to the beacon. And what that is handy for is you can see what your system performance is like and whether you can hear the beacon, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so as a, as you mentioned before, Earth, Moon, Earth, that's using the moon as a passive RF reflector, mm -hmm. I think. 
I'm now I shouldn't math on camera and I should check my statistics before I do this, but I believe that the moon is only 1% reflective, I think. Wow. So okay. you get a lot of loss. Um, if you're on the moon, you get an awesome signal, but uh, <laughs> not coming back. Uh, so that's why we use mainly JT65 or WSJTX modes. Um, not so much FT8. FT8 was sort of designed for six meters and sporadic E and then was used in HF. Uh, FT8 has some restrictions, which, which I mean, you, could, you probably could be successful, but the main one is JT65 because that takes into effect Doppler and, and, uh, and other, it, it works a lot further down in the, in the, um, signal strength i think it decodes down at like minus 25 or 30 or something like that below the noise level um and rex is the current vk and world record holder for microwave eme on 10 gigahertz so he has the furthest distance on 10 gigs okay um and the he we we also have nearby a uh, radio telescope which uh, quite a number of years ago they put a 1296 megahertz, 1 1.2 gigahertz antenna in the feed. And we're talking like this is a 35 meter dish or something. Mm. It's huge. And uh, they had a EME moon bounce contact on, on SSB, I think using half a watt or 50 milliwatts or something like that. It was wow. ridiculously slow amount of power. And the, the guys at the other end, I think, were in Western Australia using a similar type dish, and it was like five, nine signals off the wow. moon. <laughs> so um, Now you're they, just getting to the point where you've, you've built your system after, after like tuning the hot rod to peak performance. <laughs> then you start dialing back how much power you can actually use to get it to run the contact, right? Like that's yeah. always the game that we play. Hey, let's go QRP off the moon. Sure. Right. Yeah, why not? <laughs> okay. Uh, so <clears throat> some of the experimentation that we do here in VK7. So on the right-hand side there, what we've done is we had a, a antenna building day. We, we made up some jigs and got some bits and pieces to make uh, 1.2 gigahertz Yagis, and we got the club all involved and, and built about, I think we built like 15 antennas. We've got in here, in I mean, I'm in a city here with uh, 250,000 people, and we've only got probably, oh, I don't know, oh, maybe less than 300 amateurs down here in the in 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 my, my city of Hobart. I think from that, we've got, it's sort of like 30 to 30 to 35 regular 1296 meg stations. So wow. we, we sort of all decided to, to have a bit of a go at building these antennas. And, and uh, we, we have a what we call a QSO party on Sundays where we use um, a 4,000-foot mountain that we've got nearby with uh, sheer, sheer cliffs, which we use as a passive reflector to reflect our signals off. Um, we also do uh, – we've also done 2.4 and 3.4 gigahertz, so – um, 3.4 gigahertz, we actually use some old ISP um, internet service provider boxes and we converted them so that they would work on 3.4 gigahertz. What, what kind of conversion does that take? What, what are you doing to it? Uh, so basically we were, we were taking out the uh, band pass. Band, we were taking out some filtering which restricted it to one part of the band, retuning them down, and then we were adding in, a, I think we were adding in a mixer and a couple of other things so that we could, um, we could use them on single sideband and and all that sort of thing. Um, I, I I started off with that, but I my, my my unit's actually sitting off in the corner because I I upgraded to something else. But it was a good good way in. It was a, a an Australian ISP, and uh, they 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 uh, they decommissioned all of these links. And basically, I think the we got about several several you know. Um, what do you call it? Several bootloads, several car loads worth of these uh, these units, and and they were distributed all around Australia and converted. Oh wow! Okay, cool. Uh, so ten gigahertz, as we mentioned, that's terrestrial and EME. Uh, when you when you get up to twenty four gigahertz, that can start times that can start to be more challenging because you start to get water absorption. So um, <laughs> I, I mentioned about rain scatter, how right. you can scatter off of rain. Sometimes, if you have too much water in the air, so if you have uh, um, a quite a humid day or there's, there's too much humidity and too much water in the air, then you can start to get um, <laughs> issues with the the uh, 
the the signal being absorbed. And now we're, we've just started here in Australia experimenting with 122 gigahertz. Oh, my goodness. This is using radar chips out of radar guns, I believe. So, uh, <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> this, that's super the, cool. The 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 actual uh, the actual chips are actually mounted on the back, on on the feed horn of the dish, and you mo- you literally only have to move the dish like not even a degree, and you lose the signal. It's just because as you start to get higher and higher in frequency, it's- as I mentioned, the the beam widths get smaller. So when you start to right. try and aim your dish. You've got to be really, really accurate wow. because you've got to like line it up. Because if you think about so, so t- uh, satellite dishes, so I think you showed a direct TV satellite dish earlier. Right. They operate, I think, on 12 gigahertz. And if you've ever seen a satellite dish installer like aligning it, he's got a little meter and stuff like that. He only has to bump it a little bit and all of a sudden he's lost the signal. Yeah. Now, obviously, he's trying to line that up to a satellite, which is over... Uh, 30,000 kilometers away, which is what? I don't know. Don't math on camera. 10,000 miles, something sure. like that. Let's go with that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's, I'm sure it's yeah. more than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, it's, but it's the same with terrestrially. As you start to get higher in frequency, you've, you've really got to narrow in on the, on the, uh, on the signals. So mm-hmm. just a small little yeah. whack will do it. Oh, 122 gig. Oh, you don't want to bump the dish because you'll be really, really frustrated. And that's why you, you'll you see, if I go back if I go back a couple of slides, you'll see on the back of that dish how there's a gun scope. We yes. actually mount a gun scope in the back of the dish. That's and funny. there's a little there's a little hole here with a little um, with with mesh over it to stop the so the signal doesn't, you know, leak through the back of the dish. But you can look through the gun scope so that you can see what you're looking at. So we use that to align to to the moon. That's awesome. Uh, so uh, something else that we have experimented in down here in years gone past is optical. So this is up to uh, up at 470 terahertz. So this is spectrum that you can see. This is red light. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Now, what this was is this was focusing on non-line of sight paths and scatting these over in particles in the air. We're talking like dust particles and just small, small particles. Um, I think we called that one down the bottom a cloud burner because it was that that bright. It had to burn through the clouds to get to the other end. That um, also has a scope on the side of that box on the it, left there. It does, yeah. Uh, so, so that the contact was between VK seven MO Rex and and Joe here, VK seven JG. Unfortunately, Joe's a silent key. He was one of my one of my original Elmers, and uh, it was very sad when when he became a silent key. But they they uh, did uh, one way one way communication over um, a, a length of water that we call Bass Strait, which uh-huh. was 130, 136 miles wow. using uh, using light. And uh, obviously, these you need to GPS lock these. You need to GPS lock the sound cards and everything because when you're at that frequency, uh-huh. it's, it, it's yeah, quite insane. So um, I'm, I'm just curious, just looking at this, uh, this looks like you guys harvested a lot of Fresnel lenses out of televisions. <clears throat> I, I I believe so to to focus it in on one area. Yeah, right. I don't know an awful I don't know an awful lot about the uh, the box. Um, I've That's only cool. seen it once or twice, uh, but I do know that there was a story. Uh, you may, I mentioned that four thousand foot mountain that's nearby. Uh, they had one of these set up on top of it, and the four thousand foot mountain looks over the city. Mm-hmm. And when they turned it on, there was this red glow that was coming from the top <laughs> of the mountain, and I. Th- I I believe I think they had the cops turn up and were like, "What's going on up here?" Because they had all these people ringing up, going, "We can see this red glow from the mountain. We think there's a UFO or something up or there. Like we're not sure fire, what's going on. It's red, yeah. you know, who knows?" Yeah. So, uh, so that was quite amusing. But they were just like, "Oh no, we're just we're just amateur radio operators." <laughs> oh, um, oh, and um, actually, while I think about it. Uh, Rex back here with his dish. He he was in the Northern Territory in a remote part of the Northern Territory, and uh, he he un- inadvertently set up near a Defence Force airport, and uh, was trying to uh, make contact with uh, with the moon. And he had some uh, some Australian Defence Force people on his uh, on his case very quickly, asking him what he was doing, trying to shoot signals through aeroplanes. Right, right, really quick, uh, Christiana. Thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Christiana. And I hope you're feeling uh, feeling yeah. uh, better too. So yeah. it's good that you just got home from, from hospital. So that's great. So equipment, uh, as we mentioned, 1296 megahertz. You have radios such as the IC9700, the TS2000, 736, heaps of different FM mobiles, usually Yosu mobiles. I think there's a couple of ICOMs as well that will do 12, uh, 1.2 gigahertz. Obviously so that's the good. 9700, but that's yeah. maybe out of budget for some folks as they're starting out yeah there, you can there's a there's a lot of 10 watt 1296 megahertz mm-hmm. uh mobiles 1.2 gigahertz mobiles because there was one there's one particular chip uh, power amplifier chip which is relatively cheap from mitsubishi which uh was put in a lot of those radios so that's why they they made a whole heap of those mobiles at 10 watts Oh, that's awesome. The Pine Baron, thank you so much for the uh, super chat, says, great show. Thanks for the interesting content. That's the fastest way to ask a question if you throw a super chat, but I am capturing the questions, yeah. and we'll we'll take them as we go, and I do have a list that we'll get to towards the end here, so thanks for your comments. All right, cool. Uh, so once you start to get above 1.2 gigahertz, that's when you need a thing called a transverter. Now, a transverter is basically a up-down converter. Um, <clears throat> what you do is you feed a what you call an IF radio uh, intermediate frequency, we call that, uh, IF radio. So this is usually on uh, 2 metres or 70 centimetres, and it's fairly low power. So FT817818, IC75. Is that the jam? People use 817s, 818s, 817s? Uh, uh, yes, they're, they're, they're the most popular. Uh, obviously, now with the 705 being released, a lot of people are getting the 705s. Ooh. But, I mean, you could use a, you could use a bow thing. In actual fact, I was going to do a – I should do a microwave video you using a bow should. Thing. You should. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, – now I'm curious. With the 705, do, do you gain – I'm assuming you do. You gain the benefit from having the screen or is the noise so crazy that uh, it's too hard to deal with? No. So the, the benefit of the 705 over the 818 and 817 that I had was the waterfall because you can – Sometimes, if especially if your your equipment is not locked to GPS, so if yeah. it's not right on frequency, because the higher in frequency you go, mm-hmm. the more likely that you're going to be off frequency because of your your oscillator in the radio in the uh, in the transverter needs to be right on frequency. If that drifts or moves, then you could be sitting there on, on what, and you think you're on the correct frequency, but you can't hear the other guy because he's. Five ten kilohertz further up the, the gotcha. band. Gotcha. Yeah, I remember. So you did you buy a ninety seven hundred? You did, right? Yeah. Yep. And you had a couple of videos out on the GPS locking for the ninety seven hundred. You were kind of right up front with the issues that were discovered with that. Um, yeah. So okay, that makes a lot more sense now. I, I was kind of curious. I'm like, why does anybody care about this? But then um, the more you think about it, with the higher frequency stuff, absolutely. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and just to answer Don's question in the chat quickly, locking to a GPS, yes, it, do, it does mean a GPS do. Right. <clears throat> so base the the principle behind that is that if everyone who is if everyone frequency locks their radio to a GPS, then the next person who locks theirs to a GPS, it's all the GPS becomes the reference. Right. The, the that beca- and then everyone will be on the correct frequency because they're all using that one common reference. We're talking However, clock reference, right? We're, yeah, we're talking frequency reference. Oh, yes. fre- okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if you've got uh, if you have multiple stations all using different oscillators and they're all slightly off frequency from one another, that's when you run into problems. So the IC705 is handy because I can see the waterfall. So I'll be like, oh, he's 10 kilohertz further up frequency and I'll just move further uh, Okay, up. so you can compensate, um, but ideally if you were all frequency or GPS locked, then you'd be, you would have an easier go at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and GPS locking adds an extra layer of complexity, of course. So um, it's not mandatory, but for, for some of the high bands, it is mandatory, but not for some of the lower bands to get started in anyway. Um, so the way a transverter works, basically, uh, as I said, it has a local oscillator and that mixes with the IF radio frequency. So for instance, if the local oscillator of this transverter on the right-hand side here uh, was 1,152 megahertz. If you would add 144 to that, then you would get 1,296 megahertz out. There you go. Uh, and so, ba- so yeah, if you operated on one, f- if you had 144.1 written on your radio, you'd be actually operating on 1,296.1 megahertz. Just that easy. That's you're just adding numbers, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and and this is this is one of the transverters. We'll get into equipment and where I got it from uh, soon. But uh, and this prices, is a very everybody. We're going to cover prices. What uh, yeah. modest station you can put together, as well as you know, if you wanted to, you know, we'll we'll, we'll you'll see. <laughs> yeah, um, but this is a very this is a very easy one because basically all you do is you just plug in your radio and plug in an antenna, and that's it. You don't have to do anything else. Love that. So, is there any kind of uh, amplification on that, or is it just? No, so this is a barefoot one. The uh, power output of this is two and a half watts. Okay. So it's not too bad. Two and a half watts will get you across town easily, line of sight, especially if you've got a decent antenna. Some of some of the guys here uh, in in VK, we mount these to the back of like on tripods right at the antenna. So we're talking about feed lines earlier. They mount them right at the back of the the antenna, and then what they'll do is they'll run a longer piece of coax to their IF radio, which is further away from where the where the yagi or the dish is, and then that way they can they don't have to operate right next to the antenna. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. So ideally, you want directional antennas, so yagi uh, for some of the lower bands. When when you start to get above two point four gigahertz, a yagi is becomes very hard to make because <laughs> the elements become very very short christiana again yeah christiana josh uh she says josh most communication satellites are geostationary orbit 2236 miles above the equator uh no actually most are low earth orbit geostationary satellites are very big and it takes a lot of money to put them out there generally mm. Uh, but uh, but thank you to Christiana though because I mentioned before about geostationary satellites and I said ten thousand miles it's twenty two thousand miles. Oh, good correction. Yeah, thank <laughs> yeah. you for that, Christiana, and thank you for the super <clears throat> chat. I appreciate it. Uh, you'd be surprised. Yeah, we're going to get even more low Earth orbit satellites. We already are well past any number of reasonable geosynchronous with uh, Elon's internet <laughs> satellite system, uh, yeah. right, Skylink. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's just going to have. I mean, there, if anybody's worried about, well, we should all be worried about trash on the ground, but we're all going to be talking about trash in space really soon here when we start losing satellites that just, you know, smash into each yeah. other. There's whole there's it's, whole sections of NASA whose job it is to just monitor space trash. Just want to yeah. point that out to people. And the, and have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen that diagram of the Earth and it has all of the space trash around it? There, there's you can't a, actually see a website the Earth anymore. There's a yeah. website you can go to that tracks it. It's amazing. Yeah. It's actually a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, actually, speaking about satellites, Starlink, we 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 see the Starlink trails here all the time oh, early I in the morning, Skylink going over. Yeah. Starlink. Is it Starlink? No, Starlink? You, you got it. It's Starlink. Yeah. It's not Skylink. Yeah. I was wrong. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and I saw an article the other day, which I was going to do a video about, but I haven't got to it yet. Um, CubeSat. I think there's a going to be a new CubeSat, which is going to have a light on it, and amateur radio operators can trigger it and turn the light on it and pulse the light on it, which <laughs> is quite going to be quite cool. I, I can just imagine this satellite going across the, the sky flicking on and off as people trigger it on using their radio so that's right. going to be launched in the next couple of years that's cool well i mean oh we could we could probably see it then yeah yeah that's in the idea that's, we'll I, th it. I think that's yeah i think that's the point of it um i don't know <laughs> it's just just because we need troll. more light in the sky <laughs> dazed dazed in the chat says troll sat that's exactly <laughs> yeah. what it would be it would be troll sat that's exactly. awesome if we can uh, figure out how to make it like pulse morse code to uh, yeah. just hurl insults at people or call out our friends. You know, that'd be cool. Pulse your call sign or something. That's it. Yeah, right on. Uh, so, yeah, Yagi's grid packs and, and dishes. When I say about a grid pack, that's that's pretty much a dish, but with, uh, with a grid behind it. Mm -hmm. feed point with a grid behind it uh we talked about feed lines so we want low loss feed lines so usually we talk the rigid hard line stuff yes. uh not not rg58 not rg213 way too lossy even even uh, even this much rg213 or, or 58 is too lossy hit, hit on that really quick um the the importance of feed line or, or do you have some do you, is there a slide coming up i don't want to spoil it but uh we did get a couple I, of questions that were talking feed line yeah, so feed line, um, it's important to get your equipment mounted as close to the antenna as possible so that you can reduce that feed line amount. On some of the 10 uh, gigahertz, um, uh, some of the 10 gigahertz systems that we've got, they're actually a, um, a, a waveguide feed. 
and the waveguides. Uh, I, di- I didn't go into waveguides and things in this presentation because it's a bit, it's, it's beyond getting started. But uh, they're, they're mounted like basically the output of the transverter is right on the waveguide. It's like right, it's right on the antenna, right at the feed point. Mm-hmm. So there's there's almost no loss at all. Zero, that's so, the that's the best solution, right? You want to put the power immediately, no feed line, nothing that can in- incur losses, right? That's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, for instance, if you've got a transverter like this, what I would do is I would mount that up on my roof in a waterproof container box and then have maybe a short piece, maybe uh, 30, 30, uh, half a meter of coax or something like that of low loss coax to the antenna. And then I would run the IF coax down to the radio, which is not as critical and not as important. It still is important, but it's not as not as important. Dan Hilner, thank you so much for the super chat. You'll get the alert here shortly. Says beer fun, interesting topic. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, um, but you can use you can use the real, really thick hardline. The what do you call it? The Andrews um, LDF um, LDF four fifty or seven fifty. The really, the really thick stuff. If you've you're, got you're talking it, talking big hardline or <clears throat> appreciable yeah. hardline at that point. Yeah, yeah. So this okay. is this is if you want to go mounting it up on towers and stuff, and 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 you got and you're getting really serious. Uh, some other bits of pieces that you may need are a preamp to boost the the receive signal, uh, a sequencer. So what a sequencer does that that's basically controls switching in your transverter. So it turns on and off a coax switch, it turns on and off your preamp, it makes sure that your transverter does not. Um, transmit any RF before those things happen mm-hmm. because um, you don't want RF sort of going in the wrong places. <laughs> or at the wrong time. you got you got to sequence all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, otherwise, it's called yeah, big so, damage. Yeah. Yeah, so timing. That's all a sequencer does. It right. just times it. It just turns stuff on in a time sequence, and then it turns it off in, in the opposite way. Because there's an organized path to the whole thing, right? If you if you turned mm. your amp on and you weren't keyed up, or and then you, you could damage the amp that way and, and vice versa, it could be a big issue. Yeah. Yeah, uh, especially yeah. If if your amp transmits into in, not into an antenna but into nothing, you can you can blow stuff up. Right. Uh, so uh, digital modes they usually require high stability, no drift, so GPS locking. So we've we've sort of already covered yeah. the the GPS sure. locking, and there is there is a video on my channel of the GPS that I do use. If you if you want to check that out, it's yeah. A green, everybody, please. We, we we hit our goal for Hayden, but there's. Three subscribers is is not that much of a goal, right? Uh, the, the link is in the description of Hayden's channel. I, I'm telling you, he's talking about microwaves. We've talked about sporadic E. He's covered the 705. You're you're all over the place with ham radio. You have tons of topics on your channel. Please go sub to him. You're gonna you'll you'll like what you see. I guarantee it. <laughs> my my uh, I, I feel sorry for my girlfriend because I've looked through my chat my list of content to create over the next and uh, next few weeks, and I've got like 15 or 20 topics to do. So oh, everybody's got... got one of those lists, right? I just never have enough oh. time to get through it. It's it's so yeah. frustrating. Yeah. So, um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, you mentioned about three subs. Three subs is I, I never thought that I would get not what am I nine thousand subs. It's just crazy amount. Um, but I, I really appreciate everyone watching a video. And if if you guys just go and watch even just one video and 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 then maybe watch another one, I'd really appreciate it. Um. Okay, so some suppliers. Now, uh, this is where we get into some ballpark figures. So the transverter in that previous page, that that down in the bottom right hand corner, that is from that's they, these are great. These are great for those that don't have an IC ninety seven hundred, a radio with with twelve uh, one point two gigahertz, whatever. He ma- he makes these. I, th- I believe he makes these uh, in batches. So it, it, sometimes it takes quite a long time to get these. Uh, SG Lab. Uh, is based in Bulgaria. There you go. So he makes transverters on on his website. He has the 900 meg, the 12, 1.2 gig, and the 2.4 gigahertz products. He does not have the 3.4 gigahertz product on his website, but if you email him and ask him for a quote, he will give you a quote for those. Um, Cause you got, you guys got 900 megs too. So that's, a, that's another band you could start off with. You could start off with that as well. Um, I, I forgot about that band. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so yeah, he, his products are great. It's a, just a little tiny little aluminium box. And as I said, you can, it, it actually comes with a little PCB antenna. So you actually have everything that you need to get on the air with if you, if you want to run it portable or, or for a field day or something, because you imagine a soda, soda summit or a, or a field day trip or something where you've, you're very close to everyone. You could just have one of these just, you know, mounted on top of a little, little mast with the little PCB antenna and hooked up to your handheld on FM and you're on the air. So very easy. Um, transfer to costs roughly about two to three hundred dollars. That's US. Um, okay. he, he quotes he quotes the prices in euros. Um, and if you want to get something with a little bit more power, he has a twenty five watt amplifier, which is which is two hundred dollars. Is that like big power? Twenty five watts? Is that like on on? Well, in in the ninety seven hundred, you get ten watts out on twelve ninety six. So you're getting you know three dB and a little bit more on on uh, using that amplifier it's okay. not i mean you could get there's some suppliers i think w6 pql if you google that call sign w6 pql i think that is his website you can get 300 watts on 1296 so um you can get some insane amounts of power <laughs> is that like uh i mean what would be the application for that that would be for Earth, Moon, Earth. Um, okay. F- for, for EME, yeah. I mean, you could use it terrestrially and you'd have a very, very good signal. Um, but does that become... I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are watching this and are like, is this dangerous? Am I going to kill somebody? Uh, <laughs> oh, am I going to have yes. a bird fly by and have it drop out of the sky? Like, what... S- we should cover so that too. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a very good point. We'll just cover safety very quickly because I did neglect to put we, safety. We always cover safety spot. very quickly on this channel. That's our goal: <laughs> is to cover it very quickly. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go ahead. Uh, so safety. So yeah, when when you start to get up to these higher frequencies, don't stand in front of the antenna. <laughs> that's the easiest way to right. say it. You'll notice too on that dish photo, you, we've got the gun scope. Uh, pointing through that hole, there is mesh over that hole to protect us so that there's no RF leaking back through that so that because RF at these frequencies can be quite damaging, especially to your eyes, your retinas, to skin Mm -hmm. um, because it can penetrate skin. That's how x-rays work. Particularly your eyes. It'll mess your eyes up real bad, right? Yes, yes. So whatever you do, whenever you're transmitting any kind of power, don't look or don't be standing in front of the dish or have people standing in front of the dish. Kids, remember what the police told you. Don't stand so close to me. <laughs> Chris C. has it. Uh, Chris C. says safety second. I always go safety <laughs> third is kind of my default. But uh, yes, Chris, I- I'm with you. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. So uh, there's some sort of there's some sort of rough guidelines to get to get started. Obviously, the economies of scale get blown out proportionally depending on what you want to buy and where you want to buy it from. Right. Um, and and how far you want to go, uh, you can even get started if you're if you're if you're if you're smarter than me because I'm not this smart. You yeah, can you're very smart. You're very smart. I don't know sir. about that. You can you can get the individual mixes and the and the individual feed horns and the oscillators and you can build it all up from scratch if you really wanted to. But mm. what 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 these suppliers is they offer you a in the box, ready to go, out the door solution that you can just get on the air. Right. So this is more of a, a boutique. In, I, I'm guessing when you start to, to get into microwave territory, you're looking more at boutique handmade yeah. stuff. This is yeah. not a mass-produced product. You could go get a 9700, but that's like you know $1,500 or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and then you'd have to feed it appropriately and all that fun stuff. Or you could get this very specific kind of niche equipment that mm. arguably not – if you're thinking about ham radio off the total, like 500 bucks for a, a transverter and a power amplifier is not bad <clears throat> in my yeah. eye, but I don't know. And, and, uh, and I mean, uh, you can, you could also find stuff on the used market. You could find a, a 10 watt mobile. Um, you, I say mobile, you say mobile, uh, mobile, uh, Sometimes which I you say could mobile. use. I, I really, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fluid with some of the words I use, I guess, but I don't know. <laughs> Ask me how many um, uh, Topo Chicos I've had, in, uh, you know, <laughs> or aluminium. That's the other one. Al- I Aluminum. don't say aluminium, nor do I say uh, what's the other one. Not not with Australia, but the uh, jag jaguar or oh jaguar jaguar. Yeah, yeah I don't. Yeah, I think I say that'll, jag- that'll, jaguar. That'll, is I I appreciate that we're saying it wrong. I, I appreciate solder. that. Solder. So- solder. Everybody and solder. hates the way I say solder, and I'm like, yeah. I don't care. 
<laughs> thanks for pointing it out. I don't care. <laughs> that'll stir. That'll stir Don up in the chat. I think he uh, he loves the the aluminium aluminium um, uh, argument. Yeah. So yeah. Um, we've got the we got DB six NT. That's the Kune uh, shop in Germany. Um, oh, and sorry, you mentioned about handmade i believe the sg lab a lot of that is is handmade stuff i think he gets the circuit boards made up but he has to sort of mount them in the box and do all that sort of thing and and guys i want to remind everybody i think most of the links are in the description but if they're not this is a really good opportunity to go to hayden's channel and check out a lot of his videos because it's all linked there so you can you can find out what you're looking for because it'll be more form specific for probably what you want this is just a high level overview on what microwave yep. has to offer so yeah sorry keep going no that's all right and um, so he's got he's got a lot of transverters and and different bits of equipment, um, low noise amplifiers, power amplifiers, right up to forty seven gigahertz. Um, quite expensive, but it's the high end stuff. You're going to have no problems with it at all. Um, oh, another thing to also be careful of when you do get a transverter and you're using your IF radio, so your handheld or your IC seven hundred five or mm -hmm. 818 or whatever be careful how much power you put into it <laughs> because there are sure. power limits so the yeah, you could fry your i mean it, it is an amplifier it's a power amplifier right so yeah you, so yeah, yeah you got to be careful how much power you actually put into it because you could you could blow it up do not run too much power through your exciter or you more power damage your amplifier <laughs> yeah uh, there's a good american reference oh <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite show no um, it's not is it? It is. Yeah. Your favorite 100%. television show. Yes. Favorite. Yes. Yes. Home Improvement. Yes. It. It. it like was... to this day, or yeah. like when you were a yeah. kid. No, to this day. Do it's you? Bit, do you this... still watch it? Yeah, I got all the seasons. This is quite got a revelation. The... I gotta say. I've got. I... I've got all the seasons. I've got all the specials. I've got every documentary that was ever made on that show. How. How bummed were you that you couldn't activate Last Man Standing Station? Pretty bummed. <laughs> I bet. Oh my god, I've never, I've never well, heard of such a fan of Home Improvement in my well, life. I'm sorry, I, I'm taking I, a, a tangent here, but this no, is no, actually no. very odd for me. I no, be it's like no, because so what? So I'll tell you a little, I'll tell you a little quick story. Shot, we've run over time, and I'm I don't sorry care. About this. I mean, if you, if you're the one that has time restrictions i i don't well at this point no Are actually i don't have time i just i don't have time restrictions i'm just busting to use the loo that's all um, <laughs> the toilet the toilet um yeah, i know what you funny. meant i don't know how many other people think <laughs> well i thought loo was an australian australian no word. we know i mean dunny also... dunny okay okay <laughs> <laughs> um so the story was i interviewed on my channel if you check out on my channel you'll see i did an interview with jet jurgens meyer yeah um and jet jurgens meyer he was played boyd on last, last man standing, standing. And, the, yeah. and the reason that i interviewed him is because his call sign is ke0uwz uh him and his dad have a amateur radio license as does tim allen as well mm -hmm. And like, this is a couple of years ago and I'm like, in the interview, I'm freaking out. Cause like, he's like a massive celebrity to me. Like this, this is a guy who's, you know, on this TV show and stuff. And I get, I get, uh, I get on the Skype call and I say, oh, hi, hi Jet, how are you? And stuff like that. And this is before we did the interview. Right. And I said, is the, I said, is there any chance that I could get an interview with Tim Allen? And he's like, oh, I don't talk to him very often, but he's pretty busy. And, and 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 such which was expected he says but if you ever come out to the u.s let me know and i'll we'll, we'll get you backstage at last man standing and and uh and and you can meet him and, and i'm like oh, you know i'm fanboying i'm freaking out i'm going because you know it's just like to I, meet tim allen would just be like you, insane you know i activated lms right yeah yeah and you and jason activated lms i know you did yeah um, and i i was there pre-show so when people uh, yeah. are coming in as the guest audience, I was activating. Uh, I did FT8. I yep. think I hold the record for the most FT8 contacts, but I mean, I don't know that many other people did it. I chose FT8 because the noise floor is S9 plus <laughs> in that in yeah. that studio, so it's impossible to make contacts. But um, yeah, I, I had a chat with. Uh, I actually got. I was reached out to by um, John John Armadeo a yeah. couple of years ago, awesome. and John asked. John said to me, "Hey." what can we do to fix this noise issue? And what he wanted to do is he wanted to remote a HF, uh, his, the, the HF onset station. He wanted to move that to his office, which was much, much quieter and then run back the 
uh, uh, the receiver, sorry, and then run it back over 70 centimetres. And we talked about that for a couple of times. And I actually interviewed him just before when last He's man great. standing was wrapping up. John yeah. is amazing. Great guy. And John said, this, John said the same thing. He's like, if you want to come down, we'll get, oh, you, yeah. we'll get you on the show and you can you can operate the set and stuff. And, but anyway, getting getting Yeah, we're rant. Go, yeah, I, I just you, you threw me for a loop with that. Getting, getting back to home improvement, when Last Man Standing first started, I was like, oh, this is going to be so good because he's back on TV. And then it was like, hey, Ham Radio's on this channel, uh, on this video, on this TV show. How cool is that? And um, and and uh, I I was just like, yeah, I've always said that if there, uh, there's some other things that you don't know about me, Josh, too, I'm about it being a massive home improvement fan, but we'll save it for another day. Um, but uh, Stark and Wilson? <laughs> oh, Port, the guy that played Wilson, uh, unfortunately, he is a silent Did he key, pass away? Is, oh, no. Was he, he actually a ham did, radio yeah. operator? No, no. Uh, but ham radio is mentioned in an episode of Home Improvement, funny enough. Is so it? Um, okay. I, I, I don't reckon anyone actually knows that. There is a there is an episode where someone someone mentions ham radio. But, um, okay. but yeah, uh, I, I, I've this always a, said This was that, a tangent I did not expect to go on. <laughs> I always, I always said that it, the story. I'm getting to the story. Go I always ahead, said that if home, if Home Improvement ever did a reboot or reunion show, barring if I could get over due to COVID, that would be the thing that would definitely get me to the United States. I would be there on the wow. next plane, landing in Los Angeles to sit in that studio audience to watch that show. So wow, um, all right. But yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> So yeah, all from that grunt we got to we got to tool well, time. Well, thank so. you for taking on this taking us on this journey, Hayden. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, honestly. Um, so uh, getting back on topic, Down East Microwave they are in Florida. They also sell microwave gear, uh, and then we have mini kits. So they they sell kits that you can put together so microwave type kits um, and bits and pieces. They're based in Australia, and then eBay is the best. Uh, source of um, of parts, so preamps, attenuators, hardline coax, SMA connectors. You can get all of the good stuff off of eBay. Um, and, relatively and cheap from China. That you sent yeah. me all the links in the description. Yeah, if you have a look at some of my microwave videos on my channel, uh, you'll see uh, I do put eBay links uh, for some of the stuff that I've got from China on there. Mm -hmm. uh, so quickly, what I run. <coughs> Excuse me. On 1.2 gigahertz, I run the IC9700 with that 25 watt power amplifier, which is also a, a preamp and LNA, a low noise amplifier. In so one. that's that, that steps you up. Yes. So that will step that 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 if you look at the antenna down the bottom, that's a 36 element Yagi, and I run LDF 450. This is at my remote station, by the way. So I remote the IC9700. And in that box is that power amplifier. So as you can see there, it's a very, very short coax run to the antenna. Mm -hmm. And then it also doubles as a low noise amplifier. So that boosts the receive signal back down oh, to my cool. IC9700. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on my 2.4 gigahertz station, that is a portable station. Um, I use, again, I use that SG Lab transverter, the little silver box. Okay. And I use a, I use a Spectrian power amplifier which was i think pulled out of old commercial gear in the united states and that will do 63 watts on 2.4 oh, wow. gigahertz okay. so you, your, your average wi-fi yeah. router probably does 10 to 50 10 to 50 milliwatts this will do right. 63 watts so take as we the said hair off your head yeah don't stand in front of it yeah. uh, in actual fact we could probably cook your hot dogs using this so uh... well so secret secret answer why did i bring hayden on really it's i need to know how to cook a hot dog with a radio and this is the way i think this is how we do it yeah uh go, go up really high in frequency and and then you might be able to get some rf burns on a chicken or something perhaps so oh. <laughs> that could make maybe an light a cigarette video. Yeah, um, so that's also uh, got a preamplifier, a sequencer, bandpass filter. The bandpass filter is actually to filter out all of the Wi-Fi stuff. Sure, and uh, and a, a coax switch. So, um, and and I use a, a an X an old Wi-Fi grid pack antenna, which I bought off eBay. That was that was I think ninety bucks, ninety dollars. It wasn't very expensive. That's and the that uh, the metal antenna you see on the right hand picture. There. Yes, yeah. So that's a TP Link. That's a TP Link one. You can buy them off eBay. They're really cheap. Cool. And that's just plug and play. And this is inside. So it's it, it there's a there's a lot going on here. But basically, all you've got the you've got the silver box, which is the transverter. 
uh, you have the the there's an end connector on the back of the, this here. You can't quite see it, but basically the radio feeds into that, and then out of that you can see there's two ports. There's one labelled RX slash TX and another labelled RX. And what that means is that RX TX is actually transmit out, so that goes using over that blue coax straight to the amplifier, the power amplifier on the right hand side. And then it goes into a coax switch and then out to the antenna. Whereas the other line, which is receive RX goes through that bandpass filter to notch out all of the Wi-Fi stuff into a preamp and then into the other side of the coax switch and out to the antenna. Um, that, that amplifier gets crazy hot really, really quickly. That's why it's on such a big heat sink. It, and it's got three, it's actually three fans. You can't, you can see two fans at the back, but there's three fans there. Is that board isolated on the right just for noise isolation? It's kind of just uh, floating out there in space. It, it, there's nothing around it. Oh no. So, <clears throat> so that board, so the board on the right hand side is the power amplifier Okay. board. So the reason that it's there is you can't quite see, but there's actually a, a whole bunch of heat sink paste underneath it. Oh, and okay. there are, there are screws that screw it down to the, to the, the, the heat sink that you can see. So you, I'm not sure if you can see there, but that black, that black slab on the right hand side that it's sitting on is actually a heat sink. It's a, it's a big piece of metal. So oh, okay. Fair um, you can't, you can't quite see it in that photo, but it's that thermal mass. Oh, it gets really hot, especially when you're running digital modes. It gets really hot. Oh, I bet. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's not very efficient. That's the problem. Um, so my 3.4 gigahertz setup is again, the same, an SG Labs transverter, the little silver box. This is using a Stealth SM3437 power amplifier, which will do 20 watts. Same thing again, preamp sequencer coax switch. I've got two antennas. I've got, uh, sorry, three antennas. I've got a panel antenna, which is on the right. You can just see it on the right-hand side behind the box on that photo. Okay. Um, I've got a 65-centimeter dish, and then we've also got a 1.2-meter dish, which is the one with the lightning bolt. And... Uh, that's using a, a feed. We changed the feed point out, which is a, a an old tomato soup can. <laughs> so all that all that is is the tomato soup can has a little uh, an end connector drilled in the side of it with a little quarter wave quarter wave uh, probe that just sits at the correct spot in the can. Right. And uh, and then basically the signal the signal will come out of the out of the can, reflect off the dish, and that's where it's it's um it's uh, and, and that's how that works. Very cool. And again, same similar sort of thing. This one, that heat sink. Oh my goodness, that's a big, that's a big. No, let's see. That's yeah, oh, the purple one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a, <laughs> that, that 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 doesn't get as hot as the other one. <laughs> so, uh, but but it does get it does get rather hot. But that that p that power amplifier I bought off eBay as well. Uh, I think that was about one hundred and thirty dollars. So that that wasn't all that expensive either. One hundred thirty to one hundred fifty dollars. Um, and then I've just got the. The SG Lab transverter on the right there that just mm -hmm. that just drives it. Okay. I mean, there's a uh, lot of wires going on. I got to tell you, that is. A bit, uh, I'm looking at that and I'm like, maybe I can't cook a hot dog uh, within the next month. No, my uh, my yeah that that setup. So it took me a while to build these setups. I I did it over the course of probably. Uh, a couple of months to build this up just so that it i mean okay. that's not ne that's not neat at all don't look at my my wires going everywhere it could be an awful lot neater but <laughs> I, um, I i just appreciate what's going on there's there's a lot there's, uh, there's a lot going on yeah um so some of the achievements that i've had on microwaves i've had i i now hold the national vkzl record on 1.2 gigahertz that wow. was over 1500 miles that's cool using using that 36 element yagi um i now also hold the vkzl record on 2.4 gigahertz which is 1478 miles uh interesting stats interesting thing about the 1296 megahertz record someone broke the record and then i broke it seven minutes later on the same day <laughs> so oh man how pissed he, off were they uh he was like oh I've, he's it was he the didn't first even get a day out of it it was the first it was the first contact from vk7 where i am to new zealand so zl sorry for those who are not familiar zl was new zealand yeah across water there'd never been a contact from vk7 to new zealand 
uh, and he he made he made the first one. Yeah. And then I broke it seven minutes later and and added about forty miles onto it. Oh so. wow, that's funny. <laughs> And his his record was not a VK, a national record. It was only a state level record. So I actually broke the the national record because it was just over. So that was pretty cool. That's, um, that's pretty cool. Back in January of this year, I broke the two point four gigahertz record. And there's a video, the thumbnails, the the bottom left hand corner there. You can go and watch it on my channel. We that one was fourteen hundred and seventy eight miles on 2.4 gigahertz using that system and uh that was interesting because i had to learn cw very very quickly oh, wow. we, we couldn't we couldn't uh we couldn't make contact on ssb so i had to get him to send cw constantly and i had to sit there shorthand it and write it all down and to try to figure out what the call i, I knew what his call sign was but i had to get the signal report right and i could hear it clearly in the speaker and you can hear it clearly on the on the uh, on the video but i had to write down a signal report and then i confirmed it and that's when we confirmed the contact so we, cool. we hope to do we hope to do it on voice soon that's awesome yeah and on cool. three and on three on three point four gigahertz i have the state record which is uh digital which was ft8 which is a, there's also another video on my channel as well which is 312 miles nice uh just some photos here of us operating uh top Left-hand corner is the day that I broke the 1.2 gigahertz record we'd set up. That was a 40 degrees Celsius day, which is getting over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That was why we got the we got the shelter up. Nice little comfortable spot though with the little awning, so that's good. Oh yeah, it was very windy though, so oh. it almost blo <laughs> blo course. blew away. Of course it was. Uh, there's a couple of photos there from our field day operations on top of that 4,000 foot mountain. So on the right hand side was the winter field day that was uh, that was operating from up there. What is this, this white stuff you have on the ground? This is Australia. <laughs> you have snow? What is going only, on here? Only on the mountain. In actual fact, I read a news article the other day that says it, it very, very rarely, probably once every decade, it, it snows in our southern capital cities. It, we don't get snow like you do in New York and in the United States there. But, sure. uh, but we get it up on the mountains, and uh, there was snow that day. It was rather cold. And... One of my videos we I talked about recently. We've got a portable we got a portable field day van, so it's going to be a lot warmer on cold days like that. Operating from up there. Cool. Oh, dude, that video is great. Go look at the channel for that van. That van is <laughs> legit. Do you like the pneumatic I mask? I <laughs> love the pneumatic mask. That was my favorite part. That that video is legit. It is when so I cool. saw that when I saw that van for the first time because it's a, it's one of our local amateurs is has got it and he's got it on loan from somewhere and we branded it up with Ham Radio DX right, and right. Amateur Radio yeah, and stuff. Of course, of course. And when he showed me that, I was like, "That is so cool." <laughs> it was so, so cool. A great video. Go go look at Hayden's video on the the field the field van. That's super cool. So uh, the bottom left-hand corner again is our field day. Same same spot, just um, more dishes and my cars there. This is that um, shot that you look at right before you die. When yeah, you start transmitting and you're looking yeah, right in the I say, eye of the of the, of the antenna. I don't transmit. Don't transmit. Please, yet. Please, I just want to. I just this is. I'm doing it for the gram, guys. I'm doing it for the gram. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then on the right hand side is uh, is Richard VK seven ZBX. He's uh, shooting the moon through the gun scope there. So nice. that's uh, lining up the dish for a European contact. Very cool. So some additional resources. Uh, again, shameless plug for my yeah, channel. Um, head over to check out my videos. Ham Radio DX, uh, Microwaves one hundred and one. That will give a, a, a good breakdown of, of microwaves. Uh, the ARRL also has a microwave page. And Paul Wade, he is the god of microwaves. He is W1GHZ. Uh, so uh, head over to his website and he's got some additional resources as well. Okay. So to conclude, uh, getting into microwaves can be challenging, but it is very rewarding, fun, and a part of the hobby that is rarely explored. So, um, again, we mentioned about the bands not being utilized enough. It'd be great to get some more utilization out of them. Uh, equipment can be new or the source new or it can be built up from X commercial stuff. Antennas can be relatively cheap, easy to experiment with, relatively easy PCB antennas you can build up or get made up. Uh, the ultimate challenge, of course, is EME, Earth, Moon, Earth on the higher bands, if that's what you want to do, and bounce sure. signals off the moon using WSJT. And the main thing about it is give it a go. So, Like uh, all ham radio. 
Gotta try yeah. it, right? You gotta you gotta yeah. give it a try. All right. Yeah. Kill that screenshot I'll, for a second. Yeah, I'll stop my stop my screen share. Uh, got it. You got time for a couple of questions? We're already over I'd time, but yeah, yeah, I do. Would I be able to just use the uh, the bathroom quickly? Would I be able to uh, drop you for that? Yes, and then I'll of be back? course. I'll <laughs> I'll take over. Not a problem at all. So right on, everybody. Okay, so we're gonna take a couple of questions. I did capture a lot of questions from everybody. Uh, Hayden was a, a, a trooper here. Uh, this was great having him on because I, I do agree that microwave ham radio is something most people have not experienced, and I I, I want to be at least as clear as I can be. I think a lot of Hayden has a club and group of people that are about microwave ham radio. So they're going to kind of push the boundaries of what they can operate in. If you're in an area where there isn't a lot of microwave operators, then it could be difficult. So what I've heard, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm new at all this stuff. I think what you should do is find a, a ham buddy who might be able to try out microwave with you somebody who's willing to kind of go through the journey with you because it's not let me be really clear what i'm saying it's somewhere to me it feels like it's in between like expensive hf and expensive uh weak signal single sideband vhf right it, it microwaves somewhere in the middle 500 dollars for a transverter and a preamp is not a it's not free but i think if you had a buddy that is willing to try it out with you then you, you probably have a better go at it because you'll be able to test it and make sure it's working. So Hayden's back. Uh, let me throw a question at him. I do have to mention, a Ape threw something out early that I got a hit just because there's a deep reference and a deep cut, and there was an answer that, that cracked me up. Besides the moon, are other cheeses used to enhance microwave propagation? <laughs> and uh, Almost Human said, Wensleydale. And so if anybody catches the reference to that you have to drop it in the chat so to drop that in the chat if you caught what the reference was to wensleydale which is a type of cheese so i know i know the reference well let's wait and see if the chat gets it yeah, i'm sure yeah, somebody yeah. does but uh yeah. scout 75 says i forgot to bore side of my my antenna will now be my new excuse for not getting contacts uh forget your life ass explain the bodner injection thing is that i yep what is that? Yeah, I, I can I can do that. It looks like uh, just before we do, it looks like Pedro Reyes has, has got the uh, he's got the, the reference there in cheese, the chat. Grommet, cheese, grommet, cheese, <laughs> grommet, cheese, grommet. It's Wensleydale. I, I Wensleydale. I can't do it, but yes, well, I can sort of do it. I suppose I got British heritage. Mm. Wensleydale, Wensleydale. No, but the way Grom uh, Wallace says it is so like his accent is. It's his specific. accent's a Yorkshire accent, and my uh, and it is a very strong accent. Yeah. Yeah. Wensleydale. Um, Andy would be able to do it, great. <laughs> yeah. So, what is this um, Bodner injection thing? So, so the Leo Bodner injection thing, if you have a look on my channel, is basically a uh, a, a frequency reference for the IC ninety seven hundred, and it's a way of locking it to GPS or an external reference. So what you do is in the you open up your IC9700 and you install a board from uh, Leo Bodner, which is a, a store, and you install it with three screws. Uh, it sits on top of a, a, a little oscillator can in the 9700, and then you hook up uh, an SMA connector to the back. You know there's an SMA connector on the back of the, the IC9700. You replace that connector with another with a cable that's supplied. And then you can plug in a 10 megahertz, uh, sorry, you can plug in the, the Leo Bodner uh, board that he provides, a little box, a little programmable box. And what that does is it overrides the oscillator in the radio and then locks it to that external reference. And then that ah. way you can connect it. You can connect it to a GPS and and then you'll, you'll know that your IC9700 is right on frequency. It won't drift. It won't move anywhere. It's right on frequency. Good to go. So. And as we learned today, very important. Those are very important things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's also important to to try and have a state, especially at the really high frequencies, have a stable IF radio. So your eight one eight one seven eight one eight seven zero five type thing. The eight one eight eight one seven. Uh, we had a board in Australia where we could lock that to GPS. However, I've had I've had successful contacts up to. Um, we've had successful even digital EME contacts um, up on 
up, you know, up up higher and not needed to GPS lock the IF radio. So, and the seven hundred five must make that a little <coughs> bit easier with the with the GPS capability, I guess. But yeah, uh, Don says the ninety seven hundred doesn't have a ten megahertz reference out of the box. It does have a ten megahertz reference, but it's a one off reference. You have to go into the menu if you click if you plug in ten megahertz in the back. You have to calibrate it manually. ICOM released a firmware where it automatically calibrates it on the fly, but if you use it for whisper, it's not quick enough. It's not it's not fast enough. Mm -hmm. So that's where this board comes into it, and and it'll lock it in real time. So okay. got it a does, couple. It does. I, I want to go through these questions so I can let you go because I know you got to run. Out of here. No, well, so I've just I've decided that I might stick around in the after chat anyway oh, cool. because. I, there was a lot of ham. There was a lot of home improvement <laughs> references that people wanted to know. So, uh, okay. Well, so apparently it's going to be a home improvement after chat. If you want to join us on the Discord, the link is in the description and and also into the chat. But I'll give you another uh, another question. Uh, and actually, this is a very easy one. But uh, Foma Born asked, "This is a question that I should know the answer to. But what license class is required for this cool microwave stuff? For the United States, it's technician. <coughs> what is it in Australia?" Uh, so if you're a standard or an advanced licensee, then you, if you're a standard, you can operate on three of the microwave bands, advanced licensee, you can operate on all of them. But okay. that's the good thing in the United States is even if you're a technician, you can get straight into it because you've got everything. You've got everything. Oh yeah. Yeah. This meters is, and above. This is another one of those cool, like technician things. Like you can do satellites, yeah. you can do this cool microwave stuff and up, up to dangerous levels of microwaves we can we can do yeah i'm going to reset my chat i don't know why it, it did that let me see if i go back no that's weird it's all freaked out uh okay we'll just continue with the questions greg yep. k6 ec egg asks what kind of coax do you generally use so the coax that i use because i, I run portable i run it off uh, well, with my portable setups, I run the hard line. Um, it, I'm trying to remember offhand. I should have I should have written down what the what the model of it is. If you go to eBay and put in uh, ha uh, coax hard line, it's a it's a blue one. Oh, I can't remember. But if you've got if you've got uh, like a, if you're setting this up for home and you're putting it on your tower, then I'd use LDF 450 or above. Okay. Because of the just, just pay attention to how much loss it has at that particular frequency, um, okay. and 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 also see how much power it can also handle. Generally, the power limitation is not a problem unless you're um, up really high, but uh, definitely the loss. Just make sure that the loss is not excessive. You don't want to sort of be getting if you're getting three dB of loss, you're losing half your power and half your signal, and that can really make or break your your contacts and your ability to make contacts using it. So. Um, try and mount it as close to the antenna as possible is probably my advice. Okay, very good. Let me get another question here. And I lost the chat completely, so I don't know what happened, but that's fine. So, single cab Steve asks, can old ENG TV equipment be repurposed? I don't ENG. know what ENG... I, I, I gather ENG means engineering, Um I am not sure, but you can definitely get old any anything that is close to amateur frequencies. Mm -hmm. Generally, you can retune and you can get them. Uh, uh, what I would do is I would probably get the model number of the gear and then do a search for it on Google or go to say a Facebook group or a or a groups.io group for those who are interested in microwave. Uh, I think there's a Facebook group called Microwave DX. Uh, there might be a groups.io, um, forums, stuff like that. Just post in there and say, hey, guys, I've got this particular model, blah, blah, blah. Has anyone tried this on this band? Mm -hmm. Or has anyone tried moving it to this band? Obviously, if you find like, if you find a dish with a feed horn that's near 10.5 gigahertz, then there's no point trying that you know, at 24 gigahertz or, you know, a, a long way away. Just try, just try and get something that's close to the to the band that you want to operate on. And then generally uh, you can you, you can generally get it to work, yeah. He, he clarified ENG is electronic news gathering. So I'm assuming that's like van to van or to oh. the station. So I'm assuming yes, uh, just, just a hunch. Oh, and that's, yeah, yeah. So um, there would be some gear, probably mainly I would say the dishes, the antennas. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, depending on, again, depending on what frequency band they run on. The broadcasting equipment, probably not. I mean, we, especially not for a beginner. I mean, though, uh, I mentioned about those X ISP units that we that we uh, we converted. Someone someone else wrote the documentation and did all the programming and stuff, and I just followed the instructions. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to get that gear to work there. Um, but definitely, if there's other stuff in between, like filters or or mixers or oscillators, you can use you can use all that gear for sure. Don N five SKT asks, "What is the difference, or explain the difference between horns and dishes? Because you kind of use the term not interchangeably, but you mention them." Yep. So, uh, so horns basically are a very well. They're a fairly they're a fairly simple antenna. They are directional, but they they're a little bit. They're not uh, the beam width on them is not as focused as what would be coming out of a dish. Sometimes we use horns as uh as a feed point so mm -hmm. the, so that's probably a good point horns are, are, are a feed point and the dishes are the reflectors um you can oh, have different I see. okay you can you can have different feeds you could have a you could have a dipole as a feed you could have a uh in one of my videos i've got a log periodic as a feed mm. uh you can have a horn as a feed and the dish is just the reflector it's just there so that uh, you can narrow the beam width in one direction and increase the gain as well because a horn by itself does not have as much gain as if it was pointing at a dish and being reflected out. And there's all sorts of calculations and uh, and and maths around how far that needs to be from the, the centre, the focal point of the dish. Um but you can you can find all this stuff and experiment with it. I I I didn't I did a little bit of experimentation and a little bit of maths, but most of mine was just replacing the existing feed horn that was already mounted on a dish with one for the right band, and it just worked fine. So hmm. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, this was from David Fuller. What about planes that come in contact with your beam? Because I think you mentioned planes as well. Like, what does that does that damage planes? No, so you can use planes. Um, I'm not sure how far you could go up. I'm pretty sure you could go quite high. Uh, but uh, planes can actually enhance the signal depending on what frequency you're on. So uh, you can use them as a, as a passive reflector as well because they're all a metal body. You can bounce the signal off of the plane. Um, obviously, this is over very, very short distances and the plane has to be in between the two stations and you've basically physically have to almost be able to see the plane um or, you, sorry not with your eyes see the plane but rf see the plane um but yeah you could definitely use them to to scatter the signal whoa, whoa vern. vern hey vern thank you so much for the super chat that's a that's a big one thank you so much i appreciate that that's uh that's awesome man and thank you for he's been talking to me on discord thank you for for he's going to huntsville so another person going to huntsville there seems to be some problem with that campsite uh, because of the power upgrade that they're doing, so we're we're waiting to hear more information. But I think some people are in uh, in that spot. So anyway, Vern Vern Six, thank you so much. Thanks, Vern. Uh, the thing with aircraft with aircraft is because the aircraft is moving, you'll get a Doppler shift. So you have to sometimes track it, and and the higher in frequency you go, the Doppler shift I think will increase. So you need to sure. you need to you need to track that. But definitely, you can do aircraft scatter. That is another. That it is in another way. You mentioned Huntsville Hamfest too. Don't worry, I'm very jealous. I can't go to that. So <laughs> yeah, I know we, we would love for you to come out. Too. Can you That'd get me awesome. on a Can you get me on a big Zoom screen or something there, and we'll we'll hang out in like a like a YouTuber's corner or I, something? We can, and, well, I mean, I I know there's a lot of stuff we're gonna plan at night. Um, we can work something out. I think I don't think that'll be a problem. There'll be like a thousand get, laptops in, in in the proximity of whatever we're doing. So I'm sure we can make that. Yeah, work. get my, we get myself and Cal, Dex, Commander, and a few others, and we'll all we'll all let a box up there, and we'll be good to go. Yeah. So somebody asked, uh, sorry, JC asked, <clears throat> how would microwave affect drones? Laugh out loud. <laughs> well, drones. Well, uh, see, drones they do operate on those frequencies. I think the DJ, DJ, DJI drones use two point four gigahertz and five point eight gigahertz. I think they do, and they definitely have Wi-Fi capability. But yeah, yeah. Um, I guess those those drones, especially those ones, have they they have built-in safety features if they 
lose the signal to the controller. So I think even if you were to point your microwave dish at a drone flying in the sky, it's probably just going to fly back to where it started off as a right. safety feature. I got to get out of here. Yeah, and I've seen drones flying around next to big broadcast towers although if you do go and watch jason from ham radio tv he had a bit of a casualty for the drone on a broadcast tower yep. before but it can it can affect the signal strength and and depending on what drone you've got you probably could crash it yeah all right so last question and because we do got to wrap this up i appreciate all the questions in the chat we're going to go to the after chat if you want to talk more to hayden he's going to stick around for a little while and answer some questions uh, it'll take us a little while to get over there though so you know go ahead and join now on the discord I want to mention really quickly, too, as far as the uh, phone number requirement, we get bot rated, and so we need to add a level of security to prevent just all these channels coming in and just blasting us with uh, with spam, um, spamming up the channel. That's why the cell phone thing or the phone number exists. I don't know your number. I'm not asking you for your number. That's not what this is for, so just an FYI. Uh, last question from Ham Radio for non-techies. You mentioned 10 gigahertz being a good because of the high activity. What is the difference in equipment to operate on 10 gigahertz? Uh, the equipment will be a little bit more expensive because tra because it's inherently smaller. It's a higher frequency, so it's a smaller... Um, it, all of the components become a lot smaller and a lot more critical, so that means it increases the cost. Uh, so you can find 10 gigahertz transverters that are relatively cheap. I'd look at Down East Microwave in Florida. Have a look at their website because they would have uh, a couple on there. The other one is the DB6NT, the, the Kune um, transverters. They, they would have 10 gigahertz. But, yeah, getting on that band is a lot more difficult than, say, 1.2 gigahertz just because of the availability of equipment. And also you will have to source a dish that will be that, – that, a dish that will work, one that you actually got from like a commercial installation. You can't just go out and buy a 10 gigahertz dish off the shelf or a, and the Yagi is way too small. So gotcha. um, it, it is a lot more difficult, yeah. And you need high gain for Earth, Moon, Earth as well, so – Sure. You need a. Uh, you don't need a big dish. I mean, the system that they were running down here, you could run uh, with a decent amount of power, and you could work some of the larger stations who are on AMA with just a sixty centimeter dish. So you don't really need a big dish. Cool. Well, th that's the questions we're going to take for now. If you have more questions, hop on over to the Discord, and we'll try to answer them the best we can. Or Hayden will, because I don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe there's some other microwave people. <laughs> I don't there. really know what I'm talking about. Either, uh, I think you do, Mr. <laughs> record Holder and and a home improvement lover. I think you've got plenty an answer in your brain that you can you can handle. Uh, I will just mention too that I dropped a video uh, about half an hour ago on schedule, which was about the next steps, and it has all of the links and all of the links to the video Nicely playlist and everything. Done. So Nicely check that done. out on my channel. So nice, very nice. I'm gonna let Hayden go so I can wrap up the show. Hayden, you can feel free to hop on over to the Discord and, and we'll take it from there. Thank you, Hayden. You. You're wonderful. Links are in the description for everything that Hayden has been mentioning, including his channel. My chat's gone. I don't know what happened here. This whole thing just said disconnected and it's done. So I'm going to be restarting my computer. With that said, I want to give a big shout out and thank you to all my wonderful patrons. You guys really do help make all this stuff go on. I have a bunch of, uh, well, I have a new thing coming out. Um, if you're following me on Instagram, you probably saw part of it. There is a box, a big box uh, that I have that I'm putting things into. So that will be a video coming up here shortly. But again, I appreciate all the patrons. We're going to get going with the patron picks episode. Last month, there was a one vote tie for what would be the patron picks episode for that month. So I'm assuming it might win uh, for next month, which should be really fun. So all of you that are right there. You get to vote on that if you have not already. So I really do appreciate the support. Cannot say enough about that. Uh, man, Hayden, this was uh, another one of those fantastic talks from Hayden. Again, last time we talked about Sporadic E and how to kind of uh, take the best advantage of using Sporadic E to make contacts using Whisper and among other things. But this one was really informative. So if anyone's interested, again, this is technician friendly. This is something you can do with your technician license. You can get out play radio in a new and interesting way i think if you have a buddy or someone that is you know a little bit further off you'll be able to get started with it a little bit easier possibly if your club 
is microwave active, if you have a microwave active club, then you'll be able to get started with this a little bit easier, which I think is, uh, I think is pretty cool. And it's definitely an aspect of ham radio that we need to use or we lose, right? And that is vitally important to be able to protect the bands. Using them is the way we protect them, guys. That is the, the purely the answer for all of this. So if you are thinking about this, getting started in microwave, you totally should. All right. Uh, I have finished my, my beverages. I did have a Topo Chico hard seltzer. This is a strawberry and guava. Thank you, Brew Crew, by the way. That's why I hold them up at the end. This is pretty good, uh, but I do got to give a big shout out. And this, for, for you beer fans in the house, you're going you're gonna to love this. This is a belching beaver hard cider. This is a raspberry and blackberry, and it says real fruit, not clear fruit. It's really good. They did a really good job. It's not like super, super sugary sweet. Tastes fantastic. I'm going to Discord. I hope you join us over there too. Thanks so much for watching. Give me a thumbs up and subscribe if you have not because I live stream just like this every Saturday, 5 p.m. and every other Wednesday at 6 p.m. All Pacific Standard Time. Until I talk to you again, I'm Josh, KI6NAZ73. Have some memes and I'll play you out. Not the white box again. I hate that white box. I don't understand why it's there. And I will be on Twitch for my burn. So yes, Twitch will be on. All right. <laughs>